Hi, welcome to your pre-assessment for forestry machine operators base machine. My name's Sarah Chapman, I'm from MJ Woodland Services and this is a series of videos to help you pass your MPTC forestry machine operators base machine assessment. To do that today I'm joined by Michael Crutchley here. Hi from MJ Woodland Services. He's an accredited Lantra training provider and an accredited MPTC FMO assessor. Plus, he's active in the job as a forestry contractor for over 20 years, so he's very experienced and he'll be sharing his knowledge today with us. These videos wouldn't be possible without the support from an innovative training scheme called Forestry Focused Future. Plus, Callum Campbell of Forestry Services Limited from Mahuncliffe has allowed us to use his Ponzi today and his site. These videos are not a replacement for formal training. They're here to guide you and assist you to pass your assessment, but formal training should always be seeked first. In this video today, we'll be going to cover all the boring stuff that is very, very important that you should know to be able to pass your assessment. So we're going to cover PPE, your personal protective equipment, working safely, your hazards and your risks. And then I'm sorry, there's always a bit of paperwork, the health and safety legislation. But if you don't know your background on this, then you will have a high likelihood of, of failing your assessment. So it's worth watching, even though it's not that interesting. In this bit we're covering personal protective equipment, otherwise known as PPE. The PPE you use should be in line with the tasks you're going to undertake. So for FMO assessment, what you're going to need is you're going to need your super sexy helmet here, nice and red so you can see me. It can be any colour, sometimes the company you're working for will denote, donate what colour you have to wear. You need your high vis, it can be a simple waistcoat like this, or you can have more high vis heavy duty jacket depending on the weather. You need a pair of suitable gloves if you're doing anything. The disposable gloves are good if you're doing your um, hydraulic checks or anything like that. You need some ear protection, you might need some ear protection. So these can either be attached to your helmet or separately. Most importantly, you should have your own personal first aid. This is a mini one that you can carry on you. There should be one in your machine. If not, there should be a larger one somewhere on site, specifically for forestry would be good because you need your trauma set and you need some decent boots. So technically they should be your safety boots with steel toe caps. Importantly, don't wear any um, clothing which can get snagged easily with toggles, but that's your basic PPE you need to go on site with. Right, in this section we're going to cover working safely. So you've got your PPE on, you get, turn up at work, so we're going to assess the hazards for your working area first and the risks associated and who to. So you arrive on site, what hazards are on site? These could include power lines, the terrain, access points to the site, the risk zones and um, chain shot and falling or being struck by timber. So Mike's with me now. We're going to cover those points um, in each section on what you should consider. Okay, so in relation to power lines as being a hazard on site, what have we got to consider to work safely? Firstly, you need to consider if there are power lines and you've got to cross under them. You know, how to do that safely. Ideally, well, they have to have goalposts directed. And you need to talk to the power line company first and they'll tell you what the clearance should be, what your goalpost height should be. And then once you know what the guide post height should be, you need to know how tall your machine is. Ideally, it should be a sticker in the cab telling the operator what the height is so they know where they can pass underneath safely. But at the same time, that operator, when he comes onto site, should be given a site map or a briefing explaining where the crossing points are and the power lines. And also they should be familiar with guide 804, electricity at work from FISA. Um, which will give them the safe working distances from power lines and how to operate in the event of actually striking a power line. So in the unfortunate event that a machine contacts a power line, what should we do? Possible, and you can do so safely, remove the machine or whatever part is touching the power line off of the power line. If that's not possible, sit still, wait a rescue, phone the emergency services. Or if it's on fire and you feel you don't want to stay there any longer, relieve, move from the machine, not touching the cab as you go out, jump clear, 
make sure you land on both feet, don't stumble, and bunny hop away at a distance of at least 50 foot. And what by bunny hop, what do they mean by <laughs> bunny hop? So another hazard to consider is the terrain. By that we mean the ground that you're working on. So Mike, what have we got to consider when we're thinking about the ground and the machines? Okay, let's face it, in forestry, the ground's either gonna be hellish steep or boggy and with a bottomless bottom. So you know, take your pick. So what have we got to consider when working on a slope? Um, whether you can transverse that slope safely, whether the machine's gonna run away, um, whether you have a risk of turning over. And is there any guides that we can read on that? Uh, for that, you need Visa Guide 704 Steep Ground Working. And what could you put on the machine to minimise your risk? You can think about making the machine more stable, um, you know, adding extra weight, turning the tyres out, make sure all loads are nice and low, add um, traction aids to the machine, such as wheel chains or band tracks. And is there anything co to consider with boggy ground? Um, putting down a big brash mat to support the machine. Again, you might want to consider um, band tracks to spread the weight of the machine, make the surface area greater, put on wider tyres or wider tracks. Okay, so other hazards are the access route to a site and getting on to site. Is there much we should consider there? Um, you need to consider whether an ambulance can get there easily enough, especially an ordinary two-wheel drive ambulance, um, whether any of the gates are locked, um, whether it's a complicated route in, you know, lots of left and right turns. Okay, and another hazard um, would be chain shot. Not everyone might have heard what chain shot is. So can you explain what chain shot is for us? Um, where you have a harvester working, the saw that will cut the timber, um, theoretically, it's a kill range of 150 metres from the machine. It will fire off a little piece of metal, size of a 2-2 bullet, same sort of speed. Um, you don't want to meet that. No, so it's a, basically could possibly be a fatal injury. So what can we do to minimise the risk of chain shot? Um, you can ensure the cutting system on the machine is in good working order, all the guards are in place, um, the machine themselves have got um, proper protective screens in it and the sawman always points the saw away from any potential targets. So making sure that you're all working safely in your working area and there's communication between the harvester driver and the, and you as a driver of the forder. Um, is there anything on the machine, the fording machine or your base machine that would help protect against chain shot? It should have a polycarbonate windscreen of the appropriate thickness to stop chain shot. Another risk on site could be possibly being struck by timber. So is there anything we can do to help mitigate that potentially fatal possibility? Yeah, we can make sure the work site's kept nice and safe, putting signs up, make sure no one can come within two tree lengths of the tree being felled. Um, on the forwarding machine, we've got again got a risk zone, so no one can again risk of being struck by timber. Uh, any stacking, make sure the stacks the timber are kept safe again, no risk of them rolling onto people. Another hazard would be the risk zones around the machine. So what have we got to look out for to identify what the, the reach and the zone around the machine for the hazard? Uh, any machine with a crane on it should have uh, the risk zone marked, easily identifiable. Here between machine, this person is 20 metres. Anyone comes in 20 metres of the machine, operator stops work until that person leaves the area. Okay, so we've identified the hazards. So we now need to identify who's actually at risk of the hazards. So Mike, who is going to be at risk? Um, the operator themselves, um, any other workers that will be on site or managers, and any members of the public or other third, third per persons coming onto site. And if there were members of the public, why would that be on a forestry site? Is there any reason that brings them in? Um, forestry sites are a great place for recreation and all members of the public will want to come and see what you're doing. So we've done our working area hazards and risks, so we're moving on to the other section now which is your machine hazards and risks. So in relation to the machine, what are the hazards that we should consider? Uh, well, it's been hit by the machine, so you know, could be for instance run over by it. Um, it also, because it bends in the middle, we've got a crush zone here denoted by this sticker. Um, we also have the risk, because uh, it's, again, it's got moving parts you know, in the engine, but there are other moving parts. We've got prop shaft here, shown by that sticker. Keep away, because you don't want to get wrapped up in that. We've then also got high pressure fluids. 
here, hydraulic hoses. Again, we do not want to be um, having hydraulic, hydraulic fluid sprayed all over ourselves. Keep clear of those. And then moving on, we've got to think about working at height. So with working at height, what denotes working at height? Uh, working at height is whenever you leave the ground. You know, there is no minimum height. As soon as you leave the ground, you're working at height. Where you're going to be working at height, remember your three points of contact. So as such, the surfaces you're going to be working on will have some sort of grippy surface. Here we've got tread plate. It could be the sticky sandpapery type surfaces. Anything just to protect you when you are working at height, reduce, reduce the risk of falling off. And again, this machine does have a sticker warning you to wary working at height, you can fall off. Um, the other hazard of the machine to be considered is heat. So we've got frost, you know, the top of the bonnet can become hot, but more importantly, we've got the hot exhaust over there and underneath the bonnet will be a hot engine. Again, let everything cool down before we start work on these parts. Right, so we've identified the hazards of the machine. So who might be uh, to con considered at risk of, the, of those hazards? Well, as the operator of the machine himself or herself, um, others on site who might be working there, other workers, managers, supervisors, and any members of the public and their dogs who want to come onto site and children. So basically the same um, risks uh, uh, to the same people as for your working area. Yes, exactly. Okay, so we've assessed the hazards and the risks of the machine in the working area. So we really need to now put that information into um, your risk assessment and most importantly, your emergency plan. So what should we consider when we put an emergency plan together? Well, it's, firstly, it's very important to know where you are. Um, ways of identifying where you are is no postcode if you're in a sort of more of a residential area. Um, the, the, the grid reference off the old ordnance survey and if you're a bit more modern and with it you've now got the new app what three words which will put you down the right down to a three meter square area so you know where you are this would be important for when you actually want to call the ambulance as so they know where to come to also when you think about the ambulance thinking where the ambulance will get to you bear in mind these are just ordinary two-wheel drive ambulances mostly so you might want to consider whether you'll actually need the mountain rescue or the air ambulance. If you want the air ambulance, you have to consider whether you can actually land a helicopter anywhere nearby. Because the helicopters will not just land in amongst the trees and the debris. No. no. Um, and then on top of that, you'll then need to consider after, um, if you are going to take them to hospital yourself, where might the nearest hospital be? And you don't want any old hospital. Uh, you need to actual proper accident and emergency which might be further away than you th think. And then you then think uh, communicating with your managers or other uh, important people, or even being able to just talk to the local doctor for help. Okay, so it's really important to think about the access to your site. So as you say, an ambulance might not better get that, get to you. So you need to think where your nearest access point would be. So you actually could know the grid reference for the, for the, for the access to the site, as well as the grid reference to where you actually are. Yeah, you need to record the, where the ac access is. And if there's special extra people on site, you consider actually sending someone down there to meet the ambulance to help bring them up, up to site or help them in any way they can. And where should this emergency emergency plan be kept? The emergency plan should be available to everybody on site, so either on their person or kept in the cab of the machine. Well, we've just discussed what should be included in an emergency plan, and this is a this is just a simple example, and it isn't it isn't rocket science. So we would have the site name, your grid reference your meeting or access point, as we said, if we needed to meet the ambulance and the access, number for the nearest hospital, and it must be A and E, your helicopter landing site, if there is any, lo any and a grid reference perhaps, or how far it is, a phone signal is a, just a handy note to denote whether you've got good signal or poor signal, and your contact numbers for your managers or somebody off site that you would need to tell. So we've done our emergency planning and we really should consider loan working and communication. Now really you shouldn't loan work um, in the forestry because it's obviously heightens your risk greatly. So what can we do if you do loan work, what can we do to minimise that risk? Um, first it's most important you actually tell someone where you are so someone knows where you are working. 
you develop some sort of communication system so they can actually contact you or you can contact outside and have reporting in times tell them you know perhaps once an hour once every two hours just let them know you're still alive and certainly tell everyone when you're expecting to be back so you know if you're not back at the appointed time they can come and look for you at the place you've told them you're going to be yes and why is it? Why is communication on site amongst everyone so important as well? So everybody knows what they're doing, so the job can proceed properly, you know, safely and properly. And it's also for safety, so everyone knows what everyone's doing and where they're all working. So just because you're in the it got a huff on with the harvester driver, you should keep up your good communication because otherwise it could definitely impact on your safe work, safe working on site. And let's face it, we've all got a huff with a harvester driver. OK, so we've covered lots of points that you will need to show your knowledge of and demonstrate for your base machine, that's your FMO base machine assessment. And we've done it on a wheeled articulated machine and we have covered the different points if you are using a, a rigid base machine. So hopefully this will help you pass your MPTC FMO base machine assessment. As I said, this is a guide to give you some tips. It's no replacement for getting some formal training. And most importantly, read your MPTC FMO qualification guidance, which should be given to you before your assessment by the company that's registered the assessments for you. We wish you the best of luck. Other guides to look at are the FISA guides again, which we've mentioned previously. So thanks, Mike, for your expert knowledge today. It's been a pleasure. If you have any questions, um, as I say, ask your training provider or you can always contact us and we're the MJ Woodland Services.